is um, Dr. Dale Greiner. And uh, Dale <laughs> Hi, Nor. Uh, is, um, oh boy, let me, I just want to make sure I get it right. So Dr. Uh, Greiner is the um, Dr. Eileen Berman and Stanley L. Berman Foundation Chair of Biomedical Research and Professor of Me Molecular Medicine here at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And he's the co-director of the Diabetes Center of Excellence. And um, it just, uh, it was kind of a, a bit, it was kind of an interesting way that we met. Yes. Um, uh, Dr. Greiner received an endowed chair from a uh, former patient who had appendix cancer and unfortunately passed away. Um, and he called me up and he said, could you tell me a little bit about your patient? Uh, he had to accept this award and he wanted to make some, uh, some comments. And I said, I, I would love to. So we went over and we just had a great talk about uh, the patient and about appendix cancer and the possibilities. And from there, this whole research group has just grown, uh, thanks to Dale, because I, I, couldn't, I definitely couldn't do it on my own. And it's just been a wonderful opportunity to work with him and these other scientists and really get the ball rolling here at UMass. And so he's going to tell you about our avatar program. Uh, if you were here last year, he, he introduced it. And he's going to give an update on all the work that's happened. So. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Um, that's a tough person to follow. I hope you guys all, all know this. <laughs> I mean, Laura is just an extraordinary individual here, and a lot of you know her, and it's been a privilege to be around and working with her over the last couple of years. So uh, what, what I'm going to talk about, you heard Giles this morning, and Giles is actually the leader of this uh, effort, and I'm lucky enough to be helping him along with it. But he is the interim director of the Cancer Center. He's the director of the Africa Cancer Institute. And if you notice, the patient is at the top of this. And we're trying to merge the clinical care, the basic research, and translational research into a focused group to be able to start attacking the problem. Because we don't think any one group by themselves are going to be able to do this. So what is this UMass Cancer Avatar Institute? First and foremost, it, it involves what we call cancer focus teams, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But it involves clinicians, clinical pathologists, and basic researchers meeting together on particular focused groups. And I will go into the appendiceal cancer group uh, here in a minute. Because we think it takes a clinical perspective, the clinical pathology perspective, and insights from the basic research to be able to come together talk to each other and attack the problem. And this is not something that's happened traditionally here on campus. And I think Giles, as Dr. Whalen, has put together a very novel concept to push this forward. There's a couple resources involved with that. One is the tumor bank, where the clinical specimens can be obtained and used in research. One is this humanized mouse core, and I'll give you a little bit more about what that means, which is directed by me and another, another colleague, Michael Brim. And clinical pathology, which is headed by Dr. Bruce Wolde, is a critical component of being able to understand what we're doing on both the clinical and the research side. So what is a cancer center focus group? What we've done, or what Giles has done on campus, is put together a number of tumor focused groups comprised of this clinical uh, faculty, the clinical pathology, and the basic scientists. And appendiceal cancer, uh, which is headed by uh, Dr. Lambert, was the very first one that was put together. has been meeting regularly about uh, once every four or five weeks for the last year or so. And a lot of things are starting to emerge from that joint interaction, and I'll go into those a little bit. But part of this program was there were a couple issues involved with this. One of them is the IRB issues, and that is you cannot use any specimens from a clinical situation without IRB approval. And most basic researchers like me have no idea what IRBs are all about in, in people, and the clinicians are busy. So what Giles, Dr. I keep calling him Giles, and I'm sorry, I'm glad he's not here to hear me say it. Dr. Whalen did, was put together an IRB that's basically campus-wide, which is a first for this university, so that a single consent form can be used with patients, allowing, allowing those people to donate their tissues and information so it can be used 
by the researchers without any of the restrictions and regulations. What the IRB was getting deluged with was individual IRBs from 50 to 100 researchers. It was a legal and uh, administrative morass. Dr. Whalen has put together a single IRB now that everybody that wants to be involved in cancer research can use this IRB to go forward with the research that they're doing. Uh, institutional Review Board. It's a bunch of MDs and ethicists and administrators that sit around and for anything involving human subjects, it has to be approved by this Institutional Review Board. And that can be a fairly tricky administrative morass, particularly for a basic scientist to try and meander through the ramifications of approaching patients for consent to use tissues and things. So, so Dr. Whalen led that and that is now approved, which is the first sort of general universal uh, consent form on campus that allows basic researchers like me ready access to the, to the tissues, et cetera, that allow us to do the research. Uh, until then, we had no access uh, as a basic researcher. So what are the essential components of a focus group? The clinicians that treat the cancer. And in the appendiceal group, that's Dr. Laura Lampert, who is heading this focus group, and Brad Schweitzer, who you're going to hear from a little later. The clinical pathologist that diagnoses disease, that stage it, and that perform the uh, gene genetic analysis, and that's Lloyd Hutchinson, and I'll show you what he does in a few minutes, to identify causative genetic mutations that might be important in, in this. There's some basic researchers involved in the appendiceal cancer group who have developed in vivo imaging technology so that the tumor can be imaged in vivo fairly easily in a research setting. And uh, we are lucky enough to have on campus a person that's going to uh, be, I think, leading the charge to try and identify blood biomarkers for appendiceal cancer, which are desperately needed. And then there's a number of translational researchers, of which I am considered one of those, and our group is the one that developed this animal model that's the basis for the avatar that I'm going to talk about. So the very first critical thing in this whole thing is what we call the handoff. We've got a clinician over here in a surgical suite. Here's a tumor specimen. It's got to go to clinical pathology for diagnosis before it goes anywhere else. And that's usually in the past has been the dead end. It gets thrown in a fixative and there's no longer any tissue for researchers. Uh, Dr. Whalen established a tumor bank, which is administrated by Dr. Carl Simmon. And it, it intervenes at the clinical pathology point to be able, after the specimens, what's required for the clinical diagnosis to be done, to grab that, take it back to a bank situation, de-identify it, and distribute it to research, researchers. It's IRB approved, which means administratively we aren't going to end up in jail. Uh, from the uh, U.S., and he's able to, to move these tissues to researchers that want to study the tumor. He has a number of additional services that is involved from a research point of view. So then you come up to what's this cancer avatar that's sort of the catchphrase that's being out there. And that is, it's an immunodeficient mice, mouse, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, where we can implant the primary human tumor. And this mouse is in such a situation, it will not reject the tumor. It will allow the tumor to grow. And so we could set up versus an individual that's got a, a primary tumor for researchers that want to do studies. We can set up 100 or 200 or 500 mice with that individual tumor and go study that tumor without intervening or putting the patient at risk for those various kinds of studies. And there's a lot of th things you can do with this. You can look at the cancer, how robust, how rapidly the cancer grows. There's such a thing called a stem cell, that if you can identify the stem cell and, and kill it, you're going to prevent reoccurrence. You can use it as a platform for testing drugs on, on the tumor that you actually have. You can use it as a model to study metastases or other forms of therapy. In other words, where we hope to be in the future is to be able to use this to guide the clinical approach of how to attack your tumor. How did this mouse called the NSG mouse come about? It's sort of the history of my research 
in science, and you can see I have a little gray hair here. Uh, people used to put tumors into mice in the 1960s called the nude mouse. It had no hair. This also had a, a slightly deficient immune system. It was able to grow a few tumors. In 1983, there was a mutation called the severe combined immunodeficiency uh, mutation, and that's called the SCID. And that allowed a more, uh, a better depletion of the immune system of the mouse, and you could grow a few more tumors and cells in these mice. Uh, the next big step forward was in 1995 when a colleague in my, of mine at the Jackson Lab and I published a, a little critter called the Nod Skid. And for the first time in history, you could now start growing almost every, most solid tumors, and you could start growing hematological tumors, uh, uh, lymphomas, leukemias, et cetera, that you couldn't grow in mice before. And these are human tumors. And that puttered along, wasn't greatest until in 2005 we described or developed a mouse called the Nodskid IL-2 receptor gamma chain knockout, which is easier to say NSG for what that is. And what made this NSG mouse so special? And again, a little bit of gray hair. I remember David the Bubble Boy. How many people here remember David the Bubble Boy? That is actually what's called an X-linked SCID mutation, X-linked Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Mutation. And it's that mutation that we put in the mouse that made this mouse able to accept essentially every primary human tumor we've put into the mice. It also allows us to put human immune systems in the mice. So the, for the first time, we're now poised to be able to study the interaction of your primary tumor with your immune system in a mouse model. We aren't talking mouse tumors. We aren't talking mouse immune systems. We're talking your immune system and your tumor in a mouse model where we can go manipulate it without having to treat you, per se. So this is a lot of arrows, a lot of boxes, and a lot of fun things here. But this is actually the, the, the detail of this Cancer Avatar Institute. In this big box that you see there is you, the patient, where we're going to consent you to allow us to recover your tumor and hopefully call you back in in the future to get blood samples. Well, what are we going to do with that? That's going to go to Carl, Dr. Carl Simmons in the tumor bank, who's going to give it a de-identification number. So the only people that will know where this tumor came from is the physician and the tumor bank. And that's in that box, which is called a firewall. Outside of that box, the tumor or specimens are going to come out with patient number or tumor number 321. And everybody outside that box is going to have nothing but sample 321 available to them. Your identity is confidential. It's not going to be re re revealed to anybody else. And those people inside the box are sworn to secrecy uh, over death and a lot of other things, so to speak. When that tumor comes, as, as Dr. Whalen has said many times, he wants to make sure this process goes well because he doesn't want to end up with free room and board and stripes on his back. <laughs> so what we're doing with that tumor, first of all, is we're putting it into these very unique mice called the NSG mice, where we can grow up 20 mice or 50 mice with that tumor that came out. And then with that, those mice, we're distributing them to people that want to do research with on them. In other words, if somebody says, I have a new drug I want to try because I think this is going to work, we'll give them 20 mice that have that primary human tumor in it and let them give it a try. We're also working with other investigators that want to study the genetic makeup of those tumors. Do those tumors change as they grow in mice? Do they acquire new mutations like many times tumors do in people? So we can actually start studying the primary tumor that comes out of people in an unlimited number of mice to be able to basic research experimentally uh, manipulate it. So here's your actual focus group. And I'm, I'm proud to say that it's led by Laura and Brad, and I'm very happy to be part of this. We have a couple clinical pathologists that are invested in this, uh, Otto Wal Water, Walter and uh, Ed is Kozar. Uh, Lloyd is here, our clinical pathologist that's doing the gene mutation analyses on these. 
I have the privilege of overseeing this mouse system where all the tumors are implanted in mice, distributed. A do doctor called Dr. Jack Leonard, who has developed what may be a very novel new drug, is part of this group because he wants to try his drug on these primary tumors. Victor Ambrose is, going, is there to identify biomarkers in the blood, and Dr. Simon uh, uh, runs the tumor bank. And I want to just spend a second on Victor Ambrose, who's here on campus. Victor Ambrose is the person that discovered a molecule called microRNA. For that, he has received the Lasker Award in the U.S., which is the U.S. equivalent of the uh, Nobel Prize. He's won awards in Japan. He's won awards in, the, uh, in Europe. Uh, all of which are equivalent to the Nobel Prize. And just a week ago, he was announced as the uh, winner of what's called the Breakthrough Award, which came with a $3 million prize, which will probably become the U.S. Nobel Prize. So he's a very accomplished scientist, and he has now, we sucked him into this appendiceal cancer group, so to speak. And what he has learned how to do is take just that much blood and be able to extract RNA out of it and sequence it to look for biomarkers that are coming from the tumor. How he's going to work with us when he does that with people that have tumors, you get that, but since all cells release these little sequences, it's hard to tell the difference between the tumor associated and all the other cell stuff. So what we're doing now is putting the tumors in mice, bleeding the mice, and the only human microRNA in there is coming from the tumor. It's permitting him to find the needle in the haystack to go back to the patients now. So I, I think that's going to be a very exciting development that we're working with him over the next year. We can put the tumors in, watch them grow without killing the mice. And what we really want to do with these cancer focus groups is go from the clinic, grab the specimens, do some experimental modeling in these avatars, investigate them mechanistically at a biochemical and a molecular level at the bench, go back into these avatars, test our discoveries, and hopefully be able to translate that back into people. So that's sort of what has been established here on campus. It's a very unique situation. Uh, I think UMass is going to be one of the first groups in the nation that actually have actually put this kind of system together. And Hopefully it will bear fruit as clinicians, clinical pathologists, and researchers get together. Thank you.